tennis, you know. Four times a day, but five six a day. This is um, causing echo here. And no wonder, because that means trouble. That means trouble. No trouble, no story. No story. No trouble, no no one and no wonder because that means trouble. Means trouble. No trouble, no story. No story. But the notice always arrives in some unexpected guise. Report to casting. Exterminator minutes to go. Soft machine. Ticket that exploded. Um, and more recently. Mr. Burroughs will have conversation or talk or whatever. Uh, he's set up on a platform, unfortunately, and probably should have been better down below, but you can see him better. The idea, uh, previous years, Mr. Burroughs has discoursed formally on a subject several days running. Uh, this time, uh, we went back to the original idea conceived when the Kerouac School was first opened which was growing out of Kerouac's, Jack Kerouac's idea that Burroughs was one of the most intelligent men of, in America, that his conversation was real interesting. So Burroughs said he didn't want to make any particular heavy work out of it, so I said, why don't we just do conversation? You know, we just sit and uh, talk. So uh, the situation is open then for you to talk back or to ask questions or to make comments preferably not long, long speeches, but comments or questions, and to draw him out on his opinions, which are generally interesting, uh, sometimes funny, sometimes deplorable, uh, uh, always educational. Uh, he has a few ideas uh, we ran over last night that he's, of things he's been thinking about uh, cumulatively over the last few centuries. So uh, uh, I'll turn the microphone over to William Burroughs and then uh, what I would really encourage you to speak up, we have a microphone in the audience which Charlie Ross will be handling, so you'll have a chance to uh, ask questions or to draw out a point. Don't leave any points in your mind un, un, um, unquestioned. In other words, if you've got some further curiosity, inquisitiveness, do it. Uh, it's a good opportunity to talk back and forth. Ideally, uh, informally, the situation is formal, but our minds are informal, so we can go ahead, Mr. Burroughs. Hi there, this is uh, William S. Burroughs here. Yeah, I want to talk to you. Just, just after that, I was moving to London, so I was coming down every now and then. And I had a friend who I stayed with, and I gave that phone number to Burroughs in a letter. And he rang up and said to this guy, Robin Klasnick, hello. Hi there, this is uh, William S. Burroughs here. Yeah, I want to talk to you. It's PR Asia. And he said, oh, sure, piss off, and put the phone down. And when I came down to London a couple of weeks later, he said, hey, yeah, why are you, mate? He said, some, some stupid bloke rang up pretending to be William Burroughs, he said, so I just put the phone down on, on him. And I said, oh, that was probably him, he's got this number. <laughs> he said, it wasn't. I said, yeah. He said, oh, shit, he said, and I've always wanted to meet him and talk to him. He said, the one chance I get, I go and put the phone down on him. Good evening. Good evening. Well, I'll start with a few remarks about the uh, nuclear situation. Uh, it is to be remembered that on the occasion of the first atomic explosion at Alamogordo, New Mexico, Robert Oppenheimer, the creator and founding father himself, entertained the possibility of a chain reaction that would ignite the atmosphere. And he had to be calmed down by the FBI. They put him away for a couple of days. And uh, 20 years later, in 1965, on a television program, there's a television program about the atomic bomb, and everybody appeared that it had anything to do with it. Uh, he said, we are become Shiva, destroyer of worlds. So more than 20 years later, he still thought that the atom bomb would uh, eventually destroy the Earth or render it uninhabitable. And he wiped a tear out of the corner of his eye. 
and various highly placed uh, military officials appear, appeared to say it was a very difficult decision. They're talking about the decision to drop the atom bomb on Hiroshima, but apparently by the time they'd done that, it was quite easy to drop another one two days later on Nagasaki. And I thought, God defend us all from a difficult decision in the Pentagon. Uh, nobody does more harm than people who feel bad about doing it. So I sent yet another letter to Burroughs saying, uh, you know, what was the phone call about, etc. And he, I don't know how, I can't remember whether it was a phone call or a letter, but anyway, it was arranged that I should come to London, ring up from the railway station, and he would pay for a taxi cab for me to go around to his flat and meet him. Which is what I did, that was in 1973. Um... Ooh, I don't know they stole it from. Board syndicates, government of the earth, pay! Pay back the color you, you stole. Pay back red. Pay red. Pay back the red you stole for your lying flags and your Coca-Cola signs. Pay that red back to penis and blood and the sun. Pay blue. Pay back the blue you stole and bottled and doled out in eyedroppers of junk. Pay back the blue you stole for your police uniforms. Pay that blue back to the sea and sky and eyes of the earth. Pay green. Pay back the green you stole for your money. And you, dead hands stretching the vegetable people, pay back the green you stole for the green deal to sell out peoples of the earth and board the first life lifeboat in drag. Pay that green back to flowers and jungle and river and sky. Board syndicates, governments of the earth, pay back your stolen colors. Pay color back to Hassani Saba. It's just like a little tiny sketch in which he's actually taking the abstract colors and uh, the blue, the police uniforms. Hassani Saba? Hassani Saba is, uh, you know, Speaking Goldville voices, crackling paper with our names, went out in green electric shocks, dream and dream line. Less spooky who spares galaxies, we intersect them. No more. My writing arm is... Dollar, baby. <clears throat> Tell me a little bit about who Hassan Saba, Hassan Saba is, or was, and why he became so interesting to you. Oh, half me, half my sabba. Some people actually think that he's one of my characters. <laughs> they don't realize it. They don't realize the, the historical um, facts. Uh, Hasmi Sabba was a member of the Ishmaelian sect. They were very much persecuted by the uh, Orthodox uh, Muslims. Uh, the Ishmaelian sect depend, depended on a direct visitation from a spiritual entity known as the Imam. And the leader saw the Imam, and that made him a, a leader. Uh, it was something apparently you, you couldn't pay. You, if you'd done it, you'd done it, and everybody knew it. Now, uh, he was a friend of uh, the poet Omar Khayyam and uh, some soap. And they, uh, they went to school together, and the idea was that if any of them achieved um, any sort of position, he would help the others. Well, one of them did actually become a sultan. And um, Hosni Sala got a job, but he counts or something, and someone... Um, uh, some enemy got in and shuffled his accounts around and cut them up so they didn't make any sense. <laughs> and he had to flee for his life. And he went to Egypt. It was in Egypt that he learned some secret which enabled him uh, to uh, control his assassins at a distance so that he could give the word and they say he could reach as far as Paris. Well, um... There's, there's not much uh, material, and the best book is by someone called Betty Boutoul, Boutel, I think, published by Gatimar in 1924. It's never been translated, I don't know why, and there are a couple of other books uh, ref 
uh, one called Secret Societies in general, with references to Hassan Aisaba. Uh, in many ways, he was unique. Well, there was also... Um, oh, wait a minute. Yes. The uh, Caliph Hakim was also an Ismaili, and I think he was, yeah, he was after Hassan Aisaba. Well, he's one of the few uh, real tyrants who never had a bodyguard. He would ride a donkey all around Cairo. No bodyguard at all. Nobody ever laid a finger on him. In the end, he uh, he set off. There was a riot going on that he had instigated, and the whole uh, city was in flames and complete confusion. He rode out into the desert with the don a donkey and a slave. They found the donkey dead and the slave dead. They never found him. Killed. Yeah. By yeah. him, obviously. Uh, and of course, the Ismailian cult still exists, and the present uh, presumed descendants of the uh, old man of the mountain are the. Um, uh, the, um, what is his name? God, I can't think of the name now, but you know who I mean. The, um, the Omar Khan. Right. Yeah. Very unworthy descendants, I would say. Now, there, there actually, there are claims to be descendants of the old man of the mountain. They're pretty flimsy, but they're backed by the English for political reasons, who uh, upheld the genealogy. And so they became, uh, they are the heads of the present Ismailian cult, which what I don't know what in the hell they do, but I remember pictures of the, um, the, oh, the Omar Khan. They weighed about 300 pounds, and they had to, you know, balance his weight in jewels and gold. <laughs> in that case, his, his bulk was a decided advantage. the highlight of the whole album is Last Words of Hassan Sabah. And I think the reason for that is that William's voice, as it exists, is perfectly suited for what The Last Words of Hassan Sabah is about. There is something quite horrendous, quite fearful, about the whole effect that's actually created on that. Do you agree? Well, yeah, that's why we put it on the record. <laughs> And that's why it's the last section, because it seemed that this was 20 years ago, and yet the things that are being talked about are what are happening on the streets in London and Manchester, everywhere today. And that's the other thing I feel very strongly about this album, that although it's a document of a period mainly 20, 15 years ago, it's in fact very, very contemporary and modern, and certainly relevant to a lot of people and hopefully will direct a lot of people into experimenting with their own minds and their own forms of expression. So it's like a notebook for young people to remember what you can do instead of accepting the techniques that they've been handed down. Only freedom in um, How many of you read some of Burroughs? And how many have not? So very few have not. Uh, so maybe I read a page or two that's... Uh... <laughs> when did you actually become interested in William Burroughs per se? In 1965, the school I was at, the English teacher who we called Bob Brush, was a strange guy. He, he didn't seem to have much interest in anything. And then one day he came up to me and said, I think you'd like these books by this American guy called Jack Kerouac. He said, there's one called On the Road. I think if you read that, you'd really like it. So, I... Uh-oh. That's all right. Yeah, he told me about the book On the Road, which I got my father to find for me. And I read that, and through that, discovered that some of the characters were real people, one of whom was William Burroughs. So, 
I asked him to try and find books by William Burroughs. And I found Dead Fingers Talk in a paperback in a motorway services shop. And I bought it. And I used to go out at lunchtime from school and walk round in the local park and read it out loud. And I used to think it sounded really good read out loud. And at that point, I didn't know that he did readings or anything. And I told friends about it, and it just grew from there. I used to get to try and get more books by him. When did you actually first um, hear Burroughs reading? And if he hadn't have died, Jim would have stuck with the ship by necessity. Remember that the others were calling to George to jump and waiting to cast off, and they weren't going to wait very long when Jim jumped. See, if George had been in the boat, it would have been quite another story. So it is an interesting fact that George took the place of a dead man, and then that, I mean, he meant Jim took the place of George, this dead man, and that uh, George is really a pivot of the whole story. I mean, if George hadn't have died, it wouldn't have been a story. At least it would have been a different story. Funny, I didn't notice that myself until uh, last night. I just began thinking about that. Cover. About 1967, somebody had a copy of For Me Burroughs on ESP disc, which they wouldn't let me buy off them, and I still haven't got a copy. So, so, okay, there's the interest, and you're aware of the fact that he did tape, so what's the next step? Well, the next step was that in 1972, I was given a copy of File magazine from Toronto, which had a section, the yellow pages, with requests for images from lots and lots of artists and writers all over the world, the image bank request list. And I was looking through it and noticed William S. Burroughs, Duke Street, St. James, and his request was for camouflage for 1984. And I thought, oh, he, he won't still be at this address, but still I'll send something anyway. And so I sent him a small book of about 30 pages with each page. It was hand-drawn hand calligraphic collages. And it was called To Do With Smooth Paper. And I was really shocked a week later. I got a postcard back which said, Thank you for the smooth paper, William S. Burroughs. Shock horror and excitement all at once and I thought wow he really exists <laughs> and he writes back too so then I sent him a shoebox with a wax cast of Donovan's left hand minus the thumb uh, the story of how I acquired that isn't that important <laughs> and I sent him that with dead fingers thumb written on the box and he liked that too the background is revolution bomb throwing terrorists and double agents to what extent uh, these people were news at that time, I just don't know. See, the media was really in its infancy at that point. But at any rate, it apparently wasn't a popular current subject. At the present time, when terrorism is again in vogue, very much so, uh, the book might have uh, quite a lot to say to present day audiences. And also, this you notice that these are the Tsar uh, secret police. Are just exactly reminiscent of the KGB. It's like you know, just same guys stayed in there with different management. Not all that different. And the basic theme is again corruption of an ordinary person under stress. That's a reoccurring theme with Conrad. You see, you have Razumov. Uh, who's the uh, protagonist of Under Western Eyes, Nostromo, uh, Jim, uh, Will Elms in An Outcast of the Islands, and of course Elmar didn't need to be corrupted. He was already completely a complete jit. <clears throat> uh, in Conrad's own words, Razumov is an ordinary young man with a healthy capacity for work and sane ambitions. He is working towards an academic career in 30 years, he could be a respected professor. 
Then Conrad drafts this rather dull, rather stodgy young man into his novel. All Count Conrad's characters seem to be unwillingly enlisted in the cause of fiction. And no wonder, because that means trouble. No trouble, no story. And they would dodge the draft if they could. But the notice always arrives in some unexpected guise. Report to casting. Now this Haldon, a bomb-throwing terrorist who has just executed, as he says, Mr. P, uh, takes refuge in Razumov's apartment under the totally mistaken impression that Razumov sympathizes with the revolution. It was so, once this contact had been started, it was fairly obvious that when industrial records set up, at the back of your mind, you'd always be vaguely interested in doing something with the tapes. Is that fair? Is that a fair analysis of what happened? Yeah, I thought of doing the LP in 1973. It was about the first thing I suggested to him when I met him. And I wrote him letters suggesting it again and again and again for the following eight years. And then suddenly one day James Grauholtz wrote back and said, OK, just when I thought he was never going to do it. How much control did you actually have over the material that's on the album? Is that a William Burroughs selection, or a James Graholtz selection, or a Genesis Peorage selection? Uh, it's a Peter Christopherson and Genesis Peorage selection. We had total control over what was on it. Right, and um, putting having a look at the album itself, there's a lot of... Uh, sounds on the first side of the album and sounds like TG. Is that is that right? Well, you could say that it's inevitable that as we were selecting the kind of sounds that we like would have priority over what appeared on the master tape. But um, I think it's also. Hmm? Is there a purpose to the whole talk? Uh, there are a number of purposes. Could you summarize so I could follow better when I, as you're talking? Or uh, that too hard? Um, I, I couldn't hear you. What did you say? Could you summarize the purposes so I could follow the argument better as you talk? Uh, well, no, I can't summarize and talk at the same time. Uh, well, anyway, Oppenheimer's calculations may have involved simply a, a quantitative error and given a sufficient concentration of nuclear fission such as could occur in a major uh, nuclear accident or a major uh, nuclear war, and Operation Shiva will be in a no condition. Uh, spot. Well, we sounded a word of warning. Uh, spot. Well, we sounded a word of warning. Interesting that as we'd never heard those tapes, until we'd been going as TG for, what, five years. That our application of what we understood his theories to be with our music was, in fact, very close to his application of tape recording machine. You mean, you mean to say they're not TG recordings, so those wave, waves of noise between certain tracks right at the very beginning of the first time. Now, everything on there is exactly duped off the original tapes from 20 years ago or whatever. And all the noises on it were noises that he and he and some of them deliberately generated using shortwave radios and feedback and random sounds like the one now. Uh, environmental sounds and sometimes if you listen very carefully you can hear people walking about in the background talking or tight lines like and people on mopeds going to ask them something and something like that. They're being here now but the recordings may not be good as you've been setting for. Silence. Don't. It was goodbye on the line of Bradley's naked body. Love skin on a bicycle built for two like a deflated balloon. Your cool hands on his naked dollars, baby. <laughs> <laughs>